Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Roxanne Nazario with Speak Up, um, and we are going to be talking today about AB 1316. Um, I am joined by, joined by Angelica Solis Montero with the LA Coalition for Excellent Public Schools. Um, we also have two parents joining us to get today as well. Um, Michael McDaniel with Families in Action in Oakland and Christina Laster with the National Parents Union. So Hi, we want to we want to quickly jump in and give a little bit of context to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, <clears throat> so there's a sweeping scope and scale of AB 1316 that would really fundamentally damage the operations and missions of all California charter schools. The California legislature already made significant reforms back in 2019 that address transparency and accountability reforms. It is simply premature to layer new requirements on charter public schools when the positive impact of the new laws have not been evaluated yet. Um, the reference to fraud that is noted as a trigger to this bill occurred well before these significant changes in the law. And why are we basing laws off one incident and maybe one bad operator to begin with? And that's something we'll discuss a little bit more as well. But just to give you some more context and go back to 2019, um, many of us were fighting multiple um, bills at that time. There was a package of bills, um, about six in total, and about three of them did get through and pass through the legislature. Um, one was SB 126, which specifically applies to the Brown Act, Government Code Section 1090, the Political Reform Act, and the Public Records Act to charter schools, that way that they would provide greater transparency in their operations. Um, the other bill that, that passed in 2019 and went into effect last year is AB 1505 um, by Assemblyman O'Donnell. Um, this increased authorizer discretion in the charter school renewal process. It also added a requirement for community impact reports and other restrictions on new charter schools applying uh, for a new petition to open a new school. And lastly, we had AB 1505, which addressed a number of issues related to non-classroom-based charter schools, including a two-year moratorium on online charter schools that ends in 2022. Um, we'll get into more of the details in this, but I would like to point out that, you know, it's interesting that we spend a lot of time, the legislature spends a lot of time focusing on charter schools, which account for about 10% of the public schools throughout the state. Um, I think at a time when we should be focusing on putting more resources in the classroom, AB 1316 would actually take out, um, take away those options. And in addition, we'll discuss about the timing of this bill, which I think is very key, especially since we have the two year moratorium on non classroom based charter schools, which means online, which is ending in 2022. And we are seeing a lot of parents starting to make a change and make a jump to online charter schools and other programs um, that are more flexible for their children. So we'll get into more of that, but I'm going to pass it over to Angelica and she's going to share some more information um, about AB 1316. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roxanne. Uh, again, I'm Angelica Solis Montero. I am the executive director of the LA Coalition for Excellent Public Schools. But I think most importantly, I am a parent of a charter school student. Um, I made the choice when I was looking for options for my daughter to move her into a charter school here in Los Angeles. And so for me, this isn't just about my life's work to ensure equity and access to students, but it's very personal. Um, and so we're gonna start off um, by walking you through what this bill is, AB 1316 by O'Donnell, what it does to our schools and to our options as families. Um, but before we go uh, into the bill, I want to be able to uh, just share a little bit, right, about what our charter schools, I think um, many of you may know, but just for those of you that don't, charter schools are tuition-free public schools. They're open to all students. Um, They're independently operated and they run with more flexibilities than traditional public schools 
in exchange for increased accountability. So you'll hear a lot about accountability being discussed. As Roxanne just mentioned, there were a slew of bills two years ago that addressed transparency and accountability issues. Um, and so charter schools have always been held very accountable for the outcomes of their students. And if they're not performing, they get shut down. So who do charter schools serve? Um, so quick overview, there are 1,310 charter schools in the state of California. 675,000 students attend California charter schools. Roxanne also mentioned that 10% of public school students attend charter schools. Um, there are over 6 million students attending traditional schools in the, in the state of California. So when you think about the number of students that are attending charter schools, we're a big group, but we're also pretty small compared to the larger population. So it really has to make you wonder why is it that there are these efforts and these energies and these bills continuously targeting charter schools, right? And where is accountability and legislation to mitigate low achievement of traditional schools, right? When traditional schools um, are not performing, how are they being held accountable? Um, I'll give you oops, some data here, um, really specifically around um, Black and Latinx students in California. So 52% of charter schools in, in California, uh, of charter school students in California are Latino. Um, this is across the state. In some districts, like LAUSD, for example, that number is much higher. So 66% of charter school students are Latino in the LAUSD district. Statewide, we have 4.9% of Black students that are enrolled in traditional public schools, and 7.2% of Black students are enrolled in public charter schools. And we want to share this data because I think this is really important to know. Out. These are schools that have been chosen by the students and their families, right? No one forced me to attend the school that my daughter is attending or to have her attend that school. That is a choice that I've made. And so all of these um, Latinx and Black students uh, and their families are choosing charter public schools for their students. So now, what is this bill? So AB 1316 was reintroduced earlier this year, and it limits high quality public education opportunities for our kids, and it fundamentally changes the operations of California charter public schools. And specifically what that means is that it is going to um, it increases the district oversight fees for nonprofit charter public schools, again, in California, all of our charter public schools are nonprofit schools. Um, and this increase can result in up to 30% funding cuts for many schools, right? So again, in a time when we are emerging out of this pandemic, there are gonna be funds that are gonna be taken and given up to a bureaucracy instead of remaining in our schools and in our classrooms. It cuts funding for programs that serve low income minority and at risk students, right? So there will be money that is gonna be taken out of the classroom, again, in a time when we need it most to remain in our schools and for our students. And it has severe consequences for charter school flexibility and personalized programs. So there are schools that focus on special needs students. There are schools that focus on migrant students. There are schools that offer um, many personalized programs for the students that need those flexibilities. And this bill would adversely impact those schools and their ability to serve the needs of our students. So what are we gonna do about it, right? So one of the things that we have done, um, the organizations that are represented on the panel, many of you who are at home, um, we've partnered with our partners at the California Charter School Association and other advocates who understand that to meet the needs of our students, we need to be able to um, provide students and families with educational options. And so the first thing we did when 
how the language of the bill is that a lot of us began to reach out to legislators and to talk about the impact, the negative impact that this is going to have on our schools. We want to be able to have and support legislations that promote solutions and support school options for families. This legislation does not do that. Right. And another big piece about it is really mobilizing not just charter school families, but families who understand that, especially sort of coming out of this pandemic, we need to continue to protect school options for all of our families. And so we want to mobilize folks to be able to speak to legislators, to speak to other family leaders, to speak to school leaders about what this bill does and the damage that it does to our schools. And of course, we want to call on everyone to join social media. We want to thank all of you who are on Facebook. We want you to continue to share this with other community leaders, with other families, and most importantly, to communicate this with our state legislators, right? All of the impacts that this bill has on our families. So when do we do this? Today, we do this today. The bill was already introduced in the state legislature. It has moved through the Education Committee and the Appropriations Committee in the State Assembly, in the Assembly side of the House. Um, on March 12th, again, all of us and many others joined together to begin to do outreach to let people know of how severe this bill is and the impacts that it has in our schools. It's already moved out of the Appropriations Committee, right? It had until today to move out. And so come Monday, May 24th, it could be heard on the assembly floor. Between Monday the 24th through June 4th, on any of those days, the bill could hit the floor. What that means is that all of the assembly members of California will vote on this bill. That's why we have really to mobilize today on Monday morning and every day until we know this bill is gonna hit the floor. We need to mobilize and let legislators know our true concerns and our real concerns about the impact of this bill on our communities. The time is now. We are um, up against the wall as far as time is concerned to be able to let people know about the harms of this bill. And so again, you know, very specifically, what can you do? At the tail end of this program, we're gonna give you very specific links and information for how to get involved, but we need you to make your voice heard. We need you to help to amplify this message on social media, um, and we need you to meet with legislators, whether it's virtually, um, whether it's making calls to them, um, whether it's in person, they need to hear your voices because you are their constituents. Again, this bill, is going to be voted on by all of the assembly members now when it hits the floor between May 24th and June 4th. And so we really need everyone to engage their legislators and let them know um, the impacts of this bill. So with that, we're going to hear a little bit more now from um, the rest of the panelists who are going to really share examples and real life concerns um, about the bill. Thank you so much, Angelica. That was really, really thorough and informative. And we are gonna jump to parents in uh, just a second here. I also wanted to mention, um, I appreciate you sharing your personal connections to this as well. And I just wanna add really quickly that I am a charter school parent myself as well, looking to switch to an online option in the fall after finding that 14, 15 months of distance learning, online learning is great for my daughter. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to um, Christina Laster. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, share a little bit of your story. Hi everybody, it's a pleasure to be here with um, my co-parents, um, you know, really talking about our quality education choices and options for our children. I am Christina Laster. I am the Director of Policy and Legislation with the National Parents Union, but I am more um, uh, so a proud mom of four and an excited grandmother of three. Um, all of my children attend a public charter school. Our personalized learning platform have been very successful. Um, 
in those educational environments and are thriving. Um, I am excited that they have the opportunity and the access to learn and thrive um, in the ways that support their modality of learning, meaning their learning style. That's why I chose to put them in those various platforms that support them best. Um, and so I am really upset um, about the timing and the um, continued attacks on our children's education. I believe that Angelica and Ro Roxanne said very good. There are 6 million students in the state of California um, who really need a lot of energy um, and, and, and the same type of energy to um, academically achieve. But it's only a 700,000 that have chosen other things that support our children's modalities of learning to learn to, to be able to thrive that get constantly attacked. And I think that we're the parents every year that have to um, continue to show up and fight to continue to have our quality options in education for our children. Um, you, As you know, 80% of black students in the state of California can't do math at grade level and 67% can't read or write at grade level. And I chose for my grandson and my son not to be a part of that, to be able to learn and thrive and have a future and a hope. So I'm so glad to be able to be here and advocate with and for parents. Thank you for um, having me and I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Christina, for sharing that. Um, we're happy to have you as well. And next we're gonna go to um, Michael and he's going to share his story and a little bit of his background with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael McDaniel. Um, I'm a family organizer with Families in Action for Quality Education. I'm also an Oakland native, uh, born and raised, the father of four, uh, two that are, are charter school students and one that's a traditional uh, district, a uh, public district student. Um, it's extremely important to me and has been for a long time that these people that are most impacted are these children, these scholars, uh, these communities that are most impacted. They see somebody that's standing up and taking the fight to these people that looks like they do, that comes from where they come from. You know, all, far, all too often we, you know, have situations where a lot of people from our community don't show up either because They've been held back in the press for so very long, they don't really feel like that they, they have any kind of agency or power to make any kind of change. My brother and sister weren't done exactly so well by, you know, the normal education system. My parents had to use other people's addresses just so that I could kind of have a fair shake. And that's not right. No kids should have to go through that just so that they can have an equitable chance at a quality education. You know, everybody should have, you know, at least a level playing field when it comes to opportunities in this in, in life. And just because we, you know, we're black or brown doesn't mean that we are not supposed to be afforded any less of an equal chance than anybody else that's out here. You know, like uh, like they've been saying, there is only 650,000, you know, charter school students in the whole of California. How is it that that number is siphoning away and stealing kids from a system that has over six million? These aren't private schools, people. Charter schools are public schools. They're free. If anybody ever told you you need to pay to come here, that's not a charter school, and it never has been. That's a private school, and you've been had. Anybody that's telling you from the other side that, oh, my God, you know, they're privatizers. No, again, public. Keyword there. There's just a lot of rhetoric and negativity that goes on around this conversation, and I always try to do my best to inject a little more honesty, truth, and transparency to the situation, you know, as a single black father and somebody that's trying to be a leader of my community. So, you know, thank you very much for having me here. Glad to be part of the conversation. Whoo, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with those points. You made some really, really important points. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I'm gonna go over to Tanisha next. And if you could just share a little bit about, you know, yourself and maybe your, your children, their journey so far. Hi, my name is Tanisha Hall. I am the founder of Whitehall Arts Academy, which is a nonprofit performing arts academy in South Los Angeles. Um, and I live in South LA um, in another, in 90047. And my local high school is Washington High School, which is one of the worst high schools in the entire LAUSD. Um, I'm a foster parent of five children. I've so far had um, two 
that went through Washington, um, GPAs were both in the one point something, no matter how hard we fought. Um, my oldest is a senior in Washington right now, which um, they did not transition through the pandemic well at all. And um, my daughter, even though I fought, she's an IEP student, she had a 1.5 GPA, um, Got a, was failing PE because the teacher said that she had on the wrong sweatpants while doing her jumping jacks at home in her bedroom during a pandemic, you know? So um, my ninth, my youngest daughter, I took her out of Washington after the first semester because I said, this is not gonna happen anymore. And I enrolled her into iLead. I have since enrolled um, my old, my middle daughter, who's a senior. She went from having a 1.5 GPA at Washington. Now she has a three point something semester GPA at iLead. She's getting A's and B's in all of her classes. She's getting um, over 90 minutes IEP support every single week, which at Washington, her IEP support was come sit in the dean's office during lunch. That was her IEP support. Um, the teachers wrap around my youngest daughter, who's 15 in the 10th grade. We've been dealing with some issues with her um, this year. And the entire staff almost of iLead has wrapped around this child. She receives four hours of services a week from teachers coming in and tutoring with her or just sitting with her, you know, on Zoom and making sure she's doing her work. That's not going to happen at a public school. And when you have children like mine who are in the foster system and have been traumatized and we're dealing with, you know, accelerated issues, you know, going to schools where they're in this demonized, almost prisonized environment where the teachers are treating them like they're, they're villains and they're just trying to come to school and they don't understand like the things these children are dealing with at home. So um, I lead is an online charter school, which is amazing, it's phenomenal. I'm, I participate as a parent and also as a vendor. So I'm able to teach the other children and I deal with the parents and you know, some children are alternative learners. Some children need you know, a different, a different environment. It's been awesome for me, for my kids because you know there's not really any um schools in this area that i feel like can properly support my children and their learning um so this bill would completely annihilate i lead um it would make us actually ineligible to participate because based on the new bill you can only um i guess enroll in schools that are in your area um in june i'm sorry july last year my youngest son he had his left hand amputated from a firework accident that happened and um so now he has a 504 plan and he's supposed to go to middle school next year he already said he doesn't feel comfortable going into the classroom especially dealing with his injury and he wants to be an eye leading he wants to study at home if this bill passes that will not be an option for him so i'll have to figure out what i'm going to do with my now disabled child and um you know so that he can be in a comfortable learning environment so this bill i feel like it, it disproportionately attacks our brown and black babies. Um, like I said, as a parent in the neighborhood where all these schools are terrible, they're terrible. There's not one good school in this, even you know some of the other ones, there's not one good school in this neighborhood that I would send my children to, to get an adequate education. And the charter schools are our only option. Our only option. I don't have fifteen hundred dollars a month or more to spend on private school education, you know, and I shouldn't be penalized because the local public schools they hire people who are inadequate, untrained, and don't care. So this bill definitely needs to receive a no. It should not have even gotten this far, as far as I'm concerned, because it is it is a brutal attack on the future of our black and brown minority students in Los Angeles and California. Thank you so much, Tanisha. I I really couldn't agree more. And you know, the the online charter school that my daughter is going to in the fall is also I lead. And I also live in a community in the Northeast San Fernando Valley where our public schools, you know, my daughter's homeschool is a two out of ten on greatschools.org. You know, so I, I totally understand. And also having a daughter who's scared to go back to school in the fall not even dealing with some of the challenges that, that your son has. So I really appreciate you sharing all of that with us. Um, I do wanna jump in a couple more questions where we can get into. Uh, you're... Like went mute. 
Oh, my, my mic went mute, sorry, <laughs> thank you. So just real quickly, I wanna ask uh, a couple more questions, but as we talked about, AB 1316 will limit the opportunity for charter schools to respond to the needs of their students, particularly as Tanisha pointed out, the most vulnerable and underserved students who may require a more flexible schedule. Um, AB 1316 severely limits flexibility in school schedules that many students rely on to continue their education. This includes working students, teen parents, migrant students and students with disabilities. Um, so I want to ask you what, and I'm going to go to Christina first again, why, why do you think, do you it's, think important it's important for families to have access to flexible educational programs? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times people, you know, think, well, the IEP is servicing students well in this in the traditional school environment. But what they don't understand is that students with disabilities have multiple layers of needs right um have appointments outside of the you know in educational environment have other um care providers maybe mental health um medical care appointments right and so we have to be able to pivot and and, and make sure that our children um are receiving all of those multifaceted services not just it's not just about their educational well-being it's also about their medical well-being it's also about their mental health well-being and you know that traditional schedule does not suit our children very well right so also you know if you think about students that have uh, maybe some severe allergies um, my daughter has a severe citrus allergy. She carries an EpiPen. And I will tell you that when she was in the traditional educational environment, they did not protect her well, right? Um, you know, there was citrus all around. And even though um, I fought and advocated for years for them to protect her citrus allergy, just like they would a peanut allergy, it was so hard and it took so long for them to understand that this is um, life-threatening um, and that she can go into anaphylaxis. Um, and so I need to be able to protect her um, from having that um, allergic response that would then trigger her asthma attack, right? Um, and if they weren't willing to be able to be flexible to, to um, allow for the missed days that she also had, you know what I mean? To go to doctor's appointments, to go to respiratory uh, therapists, to go to allergy specialists um, and not penalize her, then that was not the appropriate environment for her, you know, to be able to learn and thrive. And so I think flexibility really does address that. Um, me being a former teenage parent, you know, I understand that there's a, also a multi-layer of needs, right? Um, throughout a, a teenage pregnancy, um, you know, and whatever people feel about that, that's, that's their opinion, but we need to be able to provide the support and the services to help those students make it over the finish line. They also may have various scheduled meetings and um, things that they're they're going to have to attend, but that doesn't mean that we can't offer them what they need to be successful to get their um, high school, you know, graduation in order, and then be able to go into higher ed or whatever they choose, right? And so the flexibility. Um, affords students, just like my daughter, just like how I was, the opportunity to succeed and to thrive. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, same question to Michael. Well, I know, you know, a lot of people try to say like education is just to kind of, uh, you know, slap it on and it either it works, sticks or it doesn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not a one size fit all type of situation. Um, every family has its own very unique nuances that they have to deal with. And the ability to have choices of how we can best address our individual scholar situation is important. A lot of times, a lot of people that end up in charter schools and what is not said are people that were already failed by traditional district public schools. They didn't offer them the services that they needed or they didn't offer them adequately. You know, they, they miss in the boat on a lot of things. So a lot of these parents had to make decisions that were best for them and their families. And so they pivoted to places with more flexibility for their child. A lot of times even, it's not even necessarily a like, you know, a connotation of even disability or hardship uh, a person could need, just have a different way they need to understand the material. So an IEP is developed. <clears throat> it says, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have you tied into you know, it's those other things, but it's necessary that every individual is allowed to have 
that level of freedom to choose what works best for them and their family and their situation. You know, what if it's a single parent like me and we're working all the time? You know, I, I do I have time to take everybody to schools and everything all the time? Maybe I don't. And an IEP is something that works best for me and my family. Now, this bill comes in and it wants to completely strip away that you know, flexibility from charter schools altogether and make them incumbent to try to offer these services in person, which would make which would totally cripple that school system, which doesn't do anything to uplift and service those kids. Like what happens to those kids then once you strip this away from them? Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much for all of those points as well. And then lastly, uh, Tanisha, if you want to chime in real quickly on that, and then we'll go to another question as well. You know, I've been in um, my my youngest son, the one who was injured, is still in LAUSD, um, which thankfully and prayerfully, he has the same teacher he had last year. Um, so even though he wasn't with me through foster care last year, my, my children are um, re relatives. So um, I knew the teacher and she's been so supportive and the school has been so supportive. Yet we've had to miss so much school, like, you know, tapping into what Michael was saying because of doctor's appointments and this and that. Um, the first first half of the school year, like we were out and the teacher was just so understanding. And I believe it's because she, you know, we had a relationship, but if we didn't have that relationship, you know, this could have been terrible. And this is why, you know, looking at, you know, the option with my other children, you know, being an iLead, um, I'm in the iLead online. Um, and, and I like the iLead online because it is a more structured program than the iLead exploration, just because of my personal schedule. I don't have the time to really kind of like structure it. Um, the iLead online is so awesome. The classes are there. The teachers are so supportive. Um, but you have the flexibility to do the work at two o'clock in the morning or 2 p.m. or 9 a.m., whatever works for you. Um, but yeah, and we're looking forward to moving forward with him. Like we have so much therapy that we're about to get into and that really will cut into a, a traditional school day. Um, and again, like with my daughter that has the IEP, um, you know, being able to get those services, you know, even outside of the regular school day, like we can do tutoring at like 6 p.m., you know, where the school day, if it doesn't happen within that school day, it's it's a wrap. I believe that charter schools, they more, they're more flexible. They work more with the family. They work more with what what does your kid need? My um my oldest, the one that's a senior right now, thanks to iLead, we got her accepted into Grand Canyon University. So she will be the first from her family to go to a university directly from high school, the first is breaking generational curses. And this is what it's about. And, you know, Washington was barely trying to get her out. She would have basically failed. She would not have graduated, you know, and I had to fight. I was fighting with teachers and fighting with the dean and fighting with the principal to the point where the principal, you know, which is where I, I finally drew my line. The principal set up a meeting with myself and my daughter and did not even show up, the principal of Washington High School didn't show up and didn't even have the decency or courtesy to you know, contact and say, hey, sorry, I didn't make it. When I reached nothing, we heard nothing. And you're supposed to be in charge of my child's education in her senior year of high school. Never again in life will my child's future be put in your hands. Not at all. I immediately moved her to iLead. And again, like I said, this, everyone has wrapped around. They're so supportive. My 15 year old has a business. The teachers all bought products from her business to support her for Christmas, you know? So I personally cannot say enough about my experience, again, as both a, a parent and as a as a vendor, you know, and this as a vendor, it threatens our I don't have a I don't have a, um, a teaching credential, even though I've been teaching music for 20 years. I have a bachelor's degree in music, but I don't have my teaching credential because I just never felt like getting it. But that will we've been teaching in schools for over 10 years that would prevent us from being able to provide these services to the students. I don't need a teaching credential to teach a kid guitar for 30 minutes or to teach a kid how to play the piano for 30 minutes. I'm not in charge of you learning how to read and write and all of that, but I utilize my music to be supplementary. So you're learning how to apply the math and music. You're learning how to apply the understanding and songwriting. You know, there's no need for us to have a teaching credential because we're supplementary vendors. Um, but the bill is just coming in to completely annihilate this system, which is really working and helping these children thrive. 
Thank you for bringing that up. That's a really important point. And, you know, they already had that in AB 1505 about, you know, um, teachers who teach elective classes and things like that getting credentialed. So if, if they have ballet classes at the school, now that ballet teacher who's been teaching ballet for 25 years has to go get a teaching credential to teach ballet. In my opinion, these are just ways to strip charter schools of what makes them special, what mm -hmm. makes them unique, what makes them innovative. Let's take away everything that makes them so appealing so that less people will want to go to them, I think is the bottom line. And um, you're just making me really excited to get my daughter started in, in iLead's online program in the fall, which is where she's going. Um, because my daughter has a lot of social anxiety. Going to school gives her so much anxiety. And then you add COVID on top of it and she's terrified. I can't get her to go anywhere in public, much less school. So thank you for sharing that. It, it just makes me excited about that. But I wanna make sure that other kids have these opportunities, not just mine and yours, any kid that needs this. And I wanna clarify before we go into the next question, we're talking about charter schools, but this is not just about charter parents and us being attacked again. This is going to affect all parents who ever want to make a different choice. And after COVID, many people are looking at taking these these um, on these programs that they maybe never would have considered before. Right. So, again, just going back to timing really being key. Um, mm -hmm. Let me jump into the next question, because this is also important. Before so you do, Roxanne, just really quick, I want to invite sure. folks that to comment on the chat, to put your questions on the chat, um, engage with us, let us know what you think. Do you have stories or examples of how this bill is going to challenge your school? Um, please put it on the chat. We want to hear from you. Thank you. That's a that's a great reminder. Yes, please. We've had some people really interacting in the chat, um, in the comments. Please continue to, especially your stories we want to hear. Um, so as we've talked about, AB 1316 is a bad proposition and negatively affects California students, families, and teachers. It draws money away from, um, that's currently being used for student services, increases operating fees, resulting in up to 30% in con uh, funding cuts um, for many schools. So my question going to Christina first is, AB 1316 will increase district supervision fees, taking more money back to the bureaucracy, by up to 30%. What would be the best use of those funds if they stayed in the schools or in online programs? So I'd like to boldly say that I, I really don't agree with the fact that the establishment that failed our children should get money to then supervise their educations because obviously they didn't know how to do it right, okay? Um, we chose, we weren't forced. Um, we were forced out maybe, but we weren't forced to choose the options we chose. And, you know, they they really don't have the fiscal management for their own entities and their own established um, institutions. I see a lot of uh, fiduciary negligence. I see a lot of fiscal misuse um, and mishandling of, of funds without accountability. And so that is very concerning to me. Um, you know, a lot of our children may be in supplementary programs like Tanisha was talking about, you know, her teaching um, music, right? My daughter is an artist. She painted this picture right here of this cheetah. Um, and, you know, she gets to take a break in the middle of the day when she has a thought or an imagination about something she wants to create and be able to have the ability to do that. And I'm not going to stifle her. But when she was going to traditional school, I'll tell you what, she got penalized for drawing her thoughts during the day. She got penalized for wanting to, instead of playing on um, recess at recess time, for taking her art materials out to the playground right? Now, if I would have not stood up and advocated and said, you know what, I have an artist here and I am going to have my daughter, um, you know, come back home and learn in an environment where she can use her creative talent, where she can use her imagination, where she's not going to get penalized, um, then I wouldn't have stifled her gift in her giftedness. And so I'm glad that I caught that. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and allow her to. Another thing is, is that oftentimes children are learned different um, coping mechanisms. Roxanne, I heard you talk about, you know, your daughter having anxiety. Well, a lot of kids during the pandemic are, are very anxious about attending, a, um, you know, in, in school environments or whatever that may be. And that's okay. Um, and so what do they do? They learn coping mechanisms, right? And so they be, need to be able to have the freedom to utilize those coping um, mechanisms, but I'm really interested in um, the hypocrisy 
by which the legislature approaches this piece because it says in um, the education code for us as parents in California that it's a part of our democratic process and protecting that process. And education code 51100, y'all look it up, um, that we as parents be co-partners in our children's educations, that we be respected, um, that we be allowed to collaborate for about their educational needs and that we have a voice, but yet this bill and this piece stifles our voice because we would have to go right back um, to trusting the establishment that failed our children to then respect us. Um, and so I am really, really wondering, is the legislature going to honor their own education code? Are they gonna honor the own uh, rules, rights, roles, and laws and responsibilities that they placed on us? Um, and said we're um, part of the democratic processes. This makes it unequal protection under that law. And so I'm very interested to find out what they have to say about that. And I plan on pursuing that answer. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Um, Michael, as far as that 30%, how could you see that better used you know, for kids and, and especially high needs children as well? Well, I mean, I could easily see it instead of being, you know, going to a lot of different places where fiscal insolvency has already been, you know, shown and proven to be how they handle their own money. Um, they could be used to really kind of reinvest in those communities, those, you know, that are that are a part of the school. You know, that's what needs to really happen. A lot of these are communities of the most economically impacted and disparaged. Those communities need to be rebuilt. And there's like not a lot of thought processes that go into even addressing that side of things. You know, when schools want, you know, people, black and brown people that have been, you know, just historically pushed to the back, left behind and stepped on and over, those communities have been ravaged and devastated and they need to be rebuilt. That's the only way you can get these families to buy back into the process, believe that they can be much more than they can and actually strive to to do that. We have so many people, you know, like, you know, we got our, our powerful parents right here and we step up, we speak out. But then we have so many more than from our same communities that don't feel like they have any agency whatsoever. And so they just let things happen. They just kind of fall by the wayside and they allow, you know, these powers to be to make decisions that directly impact them the most. And that's the thing about a lot of these policies, like AB 1316. These policies are going to affect these people who can't. A lot of these people, you know, <clears throat> who are, are signing on and have supported this bill, they can buy their way out of the situation. They can afford to do whatever they want to. Choice, I got money. The ultimate choice. That's their road. A lot of these people that are going to be the most impacted by this, though, we don't have that option. We don't have those those means. We don't have those resources to just pivot somewhere else. So those those thirty that thirty percent could go a whole long way to putting more support structures in place to actually help these families to re-educate and retrain some of these people that have already been failed by the system that are my that are my age. You know, could help rebuild these places. You know, it's just like all throughout California. You want to tell me that in the last twenty five years there hasn't been a uh, one black contractor? That could a one black land developer? Is that what you're trying to tell me now? But like, you know, the, even the just the demographic makeup of California looked very, very different 30 years ago. But there are people, certain groups are being allowed to have a pass while we're still doing like this to others, though. So it's like I look all across my city, across LA and everywhere else. Where's your black developers? You mean we have no nobody got an education? So y'all playing work then. Okay, your plan worked. Half of them are in prison. Then okay, the other half are uneducated and don't think that they could do anything because the system was built to stop them from doing anything. So that's that we could do anything with that 30 percent. It needs to be reinvested into rebuilding these ravaged communities and giving the spark of hope back to these people. Yes, absolutely. These communities have just been neglected for for decades, forever. Um, I'm going to go to Tanisha real quick, and then I'm going to have Angelica weigh in on this one real quick, and then we got one more question, which is a good one. So go ahead, Tanisha. How would you like to see that 30% spent in the classroom or on students? Well, the, I, I, 
like to say that I know that there has been a reduction in the amount of money that homeschool parents that I, you know, have to spend for extracurricular activities. Um, this, I mean, and a lot of parents that I deal with, again, as a vendor and as a parent, you know, when you're able to have your kids be in, you know, taking Japanese class and taking, you know, capoeira and taking music and taking martial arts and taking cooking and, you know, all these were part of part of these institutions and their funds have now been limited. I mean, at first those funds should be given back to the families because those of us who choose alternative choice, because usually our children are alternative learners and they're not just gonna, you know, get from a book and be able to thrive. Um, also adding the additional support for, um, for tutoring, you know, for additional services um, because how much that my family depends and relies on these tutors and relies on these additional people to just kind of explain it a different way and take the time um, to put it back in the classroom. I mean, increase teacher salaries because teachers should be receiving a working a living wage. You know, as a teacher, you shouldn't have to live below the means. You know, teachers and TAs should have a, a living wage. So I believe that the money should definitely be reinvested into into the schools, the people who are investing into our children, because just like Google gives their employees free lunch and all these great things, why aren't schools doing that as well? Because they're the ones who are preparing the kids to go and take over our future. Yes, exactly. And Helica? Yeah, I mean, I think I have had the privilege to be working with some charter schools very closely over this last year in the pandemic, I've seen how they have used their resources, oftentimes, in fact, less resources than what traditional schools have used to sort of really rise to the occasion and support students. And I've seen them um, implement plans and talk about how they're going to get students out of this pandemic, right, and how they're going to address learning loss. And this, you know, the, the, the potential um, cut to charter schools for some schools really means losing a teacher in the classroom. You know, there are some schools who are who have employed social workers to come in and help support students and families go through this crisis and who know that as students begin to return back to campus, that there will be a need for stronger social emotional um, trauma informed care. And so the cut means that they're not gonna be able to bring back that social work go social worker into the classroom. Um, the cuts mean that they're not going to be able to invest in programs that help accelerate learning, right? We know that there's been all the data, all the stories about the learning loss that our students have experienced. And so charter schools are ready and prepared to go in and start supporting students. Um, and and the cuts mean that they're not gonna be able to do a lot of those things, right? It means that they're not gonna be able to do what they've always done, which to be, which is to be student-centered, right? To be innovative and flexible in their approaches in order to meet the needs of the students. Um, and so it's gonna have real effects. It's gonna be very, look very real in the classroom and in our schools. Those cuts are not about, um, you know, cuts up at the top, they're cuts that are going to impact what the classroom looks like for our students at a time when we need those resources and the funds the most. Thank you, Angelica. It's really important to have that operator perspective in these charter schools that have been stepping up during this pandemic, not just educating our kids, but feeding families, providing diapers and formula and just basic necessities that so many of our families need. And to go back to what Tanisha was saying real quickly, there is something specific in this bill that says that takes money away from special needs students um, as far as ADA money um, because they're not in the classroom. So if they're homeschooled and they're not in the classroom, um, they want to take that money that would, you know, I guess be, I guess, you know, serve the purpose of a building away from the parents instead of giving them more money now that we're we're dealing with harder times. And this is something I heard from uh, 
my educator friend, Farnaz Kaufman, who works for iLead schools. So they're, you know, looking at all of these things and how it's going to impact them. Um, last question, which I think everybody might want to weigh on and honestly is my favorite. If you had the opportunity to have a sit down conversation with the author of this bill, Assemblyman Patrick O'Donnell, who also authored AB 1505, who is also the chair of the Education Committee um, in the Assembly. So no surprise, this bill is just passing along through because of his position. What would you say to him um, in you know a minute or two if you had the opportunity to speak with him one-on-one? -on -one? Christina? I wanted to defer to, Den to Tanisha um, and then come back around to me, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. no problem. Um, actually, let me go to Michael real quickly, if you wanted just to keep our order flowing, if you want to weigh in on on uh, that question. I, I wanted to defer as well, because Tanisha oh. needs to leave. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got to jump off. But, go ahead, um, Tanisha. I mean, I would definitely, I would ask, what's your, what's your, what is your perspective? Where are you coming from? What is your mindset? You know, what are you thinking when you're doing this? And then let me shed some light on you, because sometimes in, I'm, and I like to be an understanding person, right? Maybe from his perspective and from his view, he doesn't have any access to people like us, you know, and he might be looking at it from this tunnel vision perspective, which there's a lot of people that's like that, give you much respect. But let me shed some light on where I am. Number one, I'm, I'm not a low income person, but I'm in a low income neighborhood by choice because this is the neighborhood I choose to live in so that I can make difference and I can make change. Because if everyone who who gets to a certain economic level leaves, then what happens to the neighborhood? It keeps continuing to disintegrate. So those of us, once we reach a certain level, we need to stay, we need to fight, we need to make changes. The things that I did at Washington High School and fighting that school and fighting the injustice, then I had to make a choice to remove my child because at the end of the day, I'm not gonna put my child on a cross sacrifice my child, but you know, I still made the impact that I had to make then and taking my child and my money, I'm a, I'm a homeowner, I'm a commercial property owner in this neighborhood. So I'm taking my money, choosing voluntarily out of your school. Now you deal with that, you know, and I believe that that is the conversation I would like to have. You know, you tell me your experience, let me tell you mine and of all these other, you know, couple hundred people that I have access to, and you tell me how this decision is going to positively impact our lives and our children. Please, let's have a conversation. I would love to have a conversation with him. That's a great question. How would it positively impact my child? I appreciate that. And thank you so much, Tanisha. I know you got to hop off. Say, thank you for those extra few minutes you gave us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That Take care. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so sorry about that. We will go back to Christina. If you want to go ahead and answer, I'm sure you have some words. For I have a lot of words about, well, not particularly for O'Donnell because we've been fighting against his toxic um, attacks for quite some time. So I wanna address the um, voters directly, okay? Um, we're talking about advocating for quality education for our children. We're talking about um, ending the lethargic um, and slow to change achievement gap that ends up graduating them into the racial wealth gap and, uh, and, and makes them have future social woes. We're choosing as parents to say enough of bad education, um, but more protect our rights, protect our equal rights. And so as constituents and voters that live in his area, that continue to vote for him, I'm asking you to join us in the fight for our children's quality educations and don't vote for him. Because it's obvious to me at this point that he it doesn't care and I can't, you know, um, tell you what to do, but make an informed decision, right? I want to know what type of education his children receive. I want to know what type of education his friends' children receive. And I want to know what type of educational background his family had the access and opportunity to receive and what is uh, causing the fluent hypocrisy and attack against our children's educations. Because I will tell you, if he's operating as a legislator, he needs to think of in local parentes. And local parentes means that you will treat our children and when they're in your care, just as if they were your very own. And so if you say you represent us, 
and you say you want to uh, represent the constituents that are like us, then why aren't you treating us the same way you would treat your children and your, your family? Why aren't you thinking of our children the same way that you would think of your very own? And so now I just ask the, the constituents and the voters to stand up, to speak up and to fight back. And so that's exactly what I have to say about O'Donnell and anybody like him. And that's a great point because a lot of these legislators that are making these decisions exercise their school choice by either the zip code that they live in with better schools or they put their kids in private schools or the ultimate level of hypocrisy is these legislators who have their kids in charter schools and still attack other charter schools and other parents' right to choice. So thank you, Christina. Uh, Michael. <laughs> Well, I mean, first off, I think I would have to express to him that, you know, I don't know if you're if you really understand the climate of the world today. But if you think that the people are just going to stand by and continuously let people that have no, you know, like we just like to say a lot of times um, in my in my org, they had no skin in the game. You know, you, you're not even affected by any of these policies that you're making. You're just, you know, you're throwing out all this stuff and all of these things. They're, they're just policies and numbers to you. They're not people, you know, and that's who's in, affected by these things. They're people, there's families, there's children, there's whole communities that are being hurt right now by 1505. And yet you want to keep attacking people. You want to keep listening just to the side, you know, of the conversation that has, a, that, like you said, that's flexing their power to choose. You know, that's, that's, that's exercising their rights, but they still want to keep their foot on some other people because, again, like I always say, they don't want it to be a level playing field. They don't want equality. I mean, shoot, Donald, when he was going up through school, the worst thing that probably could have happened to him, and he wouldn't be here right now, is if a black man got the same chance as he got, because they would have probably picked that man and been like, he's way more educated than you. I'm sorry. And I see you guys both went to the same school, but you're just not smart. It's just because he's not. But that, and then after I got done being all extra eloquent with him, I'd have to look him right in the eyes and say, hey, bro, you can come holler at me outside real quick? Let, let, me, let me talk to you up over here in this, this dark alley. You want to keep it up? You, you really want to do that? Don't worry. I'll wait for you in your driveway. It's good. Can I, can I be there? <laughs> Christina, too. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. We, we need that. that um father perspective. We, we really do. So we really appreciate that. And Helica? You know, I would ask him to meet with parents um, and with students of charter schools and, and see how he would, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear how he would rationalize, um, especially given everything that I hear from charter schools school parents, um, particularly um, black and brown charter school parents, about why we have chosen these schools. Um, I'd want him to hear what the impact is for our schools, for our families, for our communities. Um, and then I'd want to be able to hear, you know, him try to defend this bill and the constant attacks against our schools, um, because these schools, the ability to have the option for many of us, right? I'm a first generation um, college student. I'm a first gen immigrant. It, these opportunities have been life changing, life changing. And, and it's not right for someone to deny us these opportunities because of special interest um, that they have. Um, it's just not right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to just add a little bit and say, you know, I lived in Long Beach for three years. Um, I am a single parent and there are what people would consider good parts of Long Beach and, and bad parts of Long Beach. And I bring up Long Beach because that is where Patrick O'Donnell's district is. 
I would have hoped that he would have gotten voted out last year, but he's a career politician. So, you know, he has name recognition, whether he's doing a good job or not, he, he gets reelected. But parents in that community really need to need to pay attention to what's going on, because uh, at the time that I lived there, I was fortunate to live in a good neighborhood, right? That as a single parent, I could barely afford. And when I would tell people what school my daughter was going to go to for kindergarten, oh, that that's a good school. That's, you know, Longfellow. Oh, that's great. You're lucky. But at the same time, I knew other people that were, you know, using addresses to try to get into that school, right? Because it's considered a good school. Why should it even be that way? Why, why we cannot lock people into their neighborhoods anymore. You know, my family moved out of our community in North Hollywood where I was going to, to elementary school because my parents didn't want me to go to the high school and the junior high school that I was supposed to go to. So they literally, you know, had the best interest, but picked us up, moved us out of our community to a very suburban community where I had a lot of trouble, uh, you know, adjusting all because you know, my parents wanted a better school. Why should we have to leave our communities to find a better school? We should not have to do that. If you choose to move for other reasons, fine. And so I would ask the families in, in you know, Long Beach to take a look at their neighborhoods and their schools and the decisions that are being made. I would love to try and, and give O'Donnell the benefit of the doubt, but I've heard him speak before. I've heard other parents try to speak to him. And it's like talking to a wall he I think is incapable of putting himself in our shoes and actually really thinking about and looking at where we're coming from. So um, that's all I will say on that. I think everybody else covered it pretty well. Um, we are coming to our time here, but I just wanna add if there's any last comments um, that anybody wants to add or anything that we might've missed, please. I would just flag for people that on the comment in the chat comment section, um, there have been links and you have the link here right in this banner. Um, it's very easy to use. Click on the link and input your information and it will automatically help connect you to your legislator's office. Make a call, let them know how this bill is going to impact you. They need to hear from us. Again, I, earlier I said our, our window and our, of opportunity to be able to share the negative impact of this bill on, with legislators is really, really short. So you need to call today. I implore you before you log off, click on the link and make the call to your legislator and then tell one other person to help you make the call as well. Thank you so much, Angelica. Thank you for bringing it back to that. Yes, our next steps are very important in any ways we can take action. I'm also going to put my email in the in the comments on our Speak Up um, feed. And so if anybody is interested in meeting with legislators in the Los Angeles area, we do have a couple meetings set up over the next couple days. Um, or if you just need help making that phone call, whatever it may be, um, you can reach out to us. Um, also, um, Families in Action has a link that you can go to to reach um, legislators in the Oakland area because we are trying to reach as many people statewide. Um, so please um, do what you, those calls, they track those calls and they keep count of them, how many oppose and how many in support. So get your, your voice in there that way. Thank you so much. I just wanna thank Angelica for joining us with the LA Coalition and Michael with Families in Action and Christina with the National Parents Union. This has been a great conversation. Thank you to, for pulling this together and coming and on. And thank you so Roxanne and speak, and speak up for hosting us. No problem. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.